Good morning, everybody. Looks like we've got uh, a few of our group here. Jessica, did you have a question? I saw your hand was up. No, I was just testing the audio, but I think it's just because nobody was speaking. <laughs> Sorry, Jessica. I, no, can I? Can you hear me? I can hear you guys. I'm just um, not getting my sound to work. Oh, I can, I can hear you. Yeah. You got it. Yeah, okay. I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, well, perfect. I don't know if Jane, it looks like Christopher, kind of same thing. looks like their audio, looks like Jane might have got on there. Their audio was trying to connect. But uh, Yeah, loud and clear now. Thanks. Is there a camera on? I can't tell because I'm on my phone. I have to drive halfway through. So Yeah, I don't see your, I don't see your, I have a camera. But yeah. Okay, perfect. And then I don't know, it looks like we have, and I kind of, I emailed Tristan because it looks like under the panelist list, we've only got six of us and then under the attendees there's quite a few and so those of you that are a school that want to if you have questions and whatnot you may have to um, raise your hand Tristan if that's how that works and we can allow them to talk or bring them into the um, into the panelist list area yep sometimes zoom depending on which link you use to get into the meeting it will dump you into the attendees or the panelists. And then when so many people are trying to come into the meeting, it has a hard time moving people over. So okay. I will work to get you guys moved over as I can. Okay, sounds good. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started, guys. It's 11 o'clock and be a cognizant everybody's time. And so good morning. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Jay Phillips. I'm the senior manager here at OPI about within our uh, centralized services division. And I think everybody should have the agenda. It's, it's pretty light, but I'm actually going to do actually talk about a couple things that I don't have on the agenda real quick. Um, the primary piece was um, the review of that direct and indirect cost workbook. But after having some conversations with Cheryl, um, there's there's two things additional that I want to talk about. The first thing is, is that Cheryl's gotten some communications that the, the school providers that in the negotiation process that there is or has been some questions around what percentage they should be using for that um, negotiation. Now, I know that, um, you know, working with DPHHS, and um, I think that, I'm not sure if we have DPHHS on here today, but uh, Megan was unable to attend today. So if there's questions we have for her, we can pull her in on the next one. But there, there's, there's confusion around that, the enhanced FMAP rate that DPHHS is using right now to apply. You know, as many of you know that we talked about that that negotiated per diem rate or that daily rate is going to be at about 65%. And the FMAP rate, I think, is at around 71%. And that enhanced FMAP rate is only a temporary um, benefit to the providers, you know, for those that are receiving the CSCT services that CMS has actually come back and said that they're going to pay out an additional a higher percentage of the actual cost, which means that the match requirement for the state or eventually for the providers, so once we get that IGT process, that it will mean less match requirement. And so, but what that does not mean is that during the negotiations of your guys' contracts with the third party providers, that you should be, um, you shouldn't be trying to negotiate a rate at that higher percentage or that 71% that those FMAP or those um, negotiated rates should still be at that about that 65% of what we've been talking about since the beginning of all this. And so if, um, I don't know if anybody has questions on that, um, around that, or if you are in the process of actually doing a negotiation where um, it's been proposed to you that it should be at that 71%, you know, I'll open up the, the floor at this time. If, again, if you guys want to discuss that further, or if you want to wait and you guys want to send us specific questions um, directly, you can do that as well. So does, does anybody have any questions around that 71%, the enhanced FMAP rate? versus the the sixty five percent CMS per diem approved rate. Okay, so I don't see any. So so again if anybody has questions on that, um, please feel free to reach out to Cheryl and myself so we can make sure we have clarification on that. Okay, and then the second thing I want to touch base on real quick was the try to give an update on the bridge funding. I talked with Megan and we don't have an exact amount right now of what's actually been used. Um, the DPHHS is in, still in the process of updating the, the MMIS system, which in speaking with Megan, it should be um, November 11th when that's going to go live. But because the, the system itself has not been up, I think claims as of 10-1 of 21 
um, have not really been submitted. And so there, there have been that were submitted prior to that October date, which Megan had stated was about $153,000 resulting in the state match share that uh, would come out of that bridge funding. And so if you remember back in the J- July through September, there was about $653,000 of that bridge funding that had been expended. And so if you add in that new 153000 then total amount of bridge funding that's been expended to date is about just a little bit over $800,000. Now, again, with that said is that, you know, with those claims that were submitted post or will be submitted after October 1st for services that have been rendered, then that amount will actually go up. Um, and speaking with Megan, though, it still sounds like that the initial projections of DPHHS that they'll have enough um, funding of that bridge funding to uh, to pay for that match requirement <clears throat> um, through November is still going to stand. And so it looks like the the first claims that will actually will start that IGT process will be for December claims um, again that are submitted in December and will be paid out in January. And so with that, I'm going to kind of segue that into the workbook. Um, I've given this to Cheryl uh, to go over during the last meeting, and I think she went over it, but I wanted to take an opportunity to go through it one more time. And so there's a a couple things in this process. Sorry, I'm going to share something here with you real quick. Um, Through the process, we are going to be working with DPHHS. Um, We have the the IGT... um, uh, ISA that's going to be filled out, you know, completed between the DPHHS um, OPI and then also the the providers, those are going to be part of the IGT process. And in that um, process, part of what it's going to state is that for when claims are actually submitted to DPHHS um, for processing, um, they're going to actually send us monthly or the first of each month a report that's going to reflect, um, look something like the, the screen that I have up here. And what it is, it's basically, it's kind of like what we showed you guys before when we talked about the actual match requirements. This will show for a period of time. So in this instance, we'll say a month where there was actually um, claims submitted in total of $218,000, which is this column K, row 13 amount. And of that, there's a couple components of it that, you know, if we need clarification, again, I would have rather have DPHHS go through this, but there's some of those claims are actually eligible under the, the CHIP program. So a portion of those claims are covered through that. And then there's also that the component that we've talked about with the Medicaid state share portion of it um, that with that per diem rate and, and what we're looking to get improved, approved by CMS. And what the report will show again is the total of CSCT costs for that provider. Now, when I say provider, one of the things that you guys use that when a claim is submitted, there's what's called an MPI number, which you guys should be familiar with. And then under that MPI number, it'll give us a summary report. Um, It'll also tell us with the school who's the primary of that MPI. And it'll show the most critical thing here for you guys would be this, what's called the all CSTT state share component of it. And this is the piece that for the claims that have been submitted, that's going to be the match requirement that you're going to have to submit in for services that were provided um, that check to OPI for, for us to process through that IGT process. Okay. Um, in the report, it will also have a tab that's going to include, because underneath um, one MPI number, there may be several schools that are actually or teams that are um, associated with that MPI number. So it will have individual breakout information by each one of those schools um, for that, again, for that claim month. And so, again, if the, the CHIP funding portion of it applies, then you'd see a portion of that that's being deducted out. And then also there's the Medicaid portion of it. And it'll show just for that school what their state share is and then what their total all CSDT claims that were submitted for that month totals. And at the end of that, in that that final row or column J, you'll still see that same amount that was on that initial tab, which is that summary report of that $60,820 match requirement that needs to be submitted. Okay. And so when that report will actually be sent to the schools, um, what OPA is going to ask is that you, there is a, a certification that's completed. Let's see, I think you guys can you see here. Let me make sure. Sorry. There we go. So what you guys see will get is um, they'll be available on our website. And this is going to be called a CSCT expenditure certification form. And we've developed this to kind of help the, the schools in, in kind of um, streamline the process and what actually is submitted to OPI for documentation 
um, for certification and also for support for attesting to like the direct and non-direct CSCT costs that will meet that match. And so as the, the school provider, you'll want to go to our website, you'll pull up this form, you'll want to enter in the, the date, the month, and then the year of the claim that you're submitting, um, the school district or treater provider name, and this would actually be the name that, that's associated with that MPI number that's in the MMIS system. And then again, that MPI number that is this comes from that report that each one of you guys schools as providers use to um, process your claims. And then there's a spot here where for the monthly match requirement, you can actually enter in what that match amount is. Now this match amount is actually, it's this box is tied to um, this B, column B down here to this row 22. So if you go in there and you actually enter that in there, it'll, it'll pre-populate and any of these, these cells that are grayed out, those are actually cells that are gonna pre-populate um, from other, act, other um, box of cells within the, the workbook itself, okay? Now, once you've got that filled out again, it will show your match requirement down here. And then there's two working tabs that you can use. Um, first one is called the CSCT Direct. And what this is designed to do is that for, you know, those you know, providers that actually have direct CSCT costs, you have staff that um, you are paying out of those, you know, paying as CSCT related expenditures. Let's say you have a, a teacher or whatever that you pay a portion of their salary to the CSCT activities. Then you can enter in that position's name. You can actually enter in the salaries that you paid out for that month, including the, the fringe benefits. And it's set up so, again, if you have multiple people that you want to enter in here, then you can enter each one of those individually. And then the total amount of that will, will pre-populate or calculate down here in the bottom of, the, of this workbook tab. There's also a section in here for operational costs. So, again, if there are certain supplies or things that you have that you can directly relate to CSCT, you know, you at the school, you're using, again, those project reporter codes so that you can designate certain costs to that program. Then those costs can be pulled out for that month again, and we call them, we'll call them direct charges because you have those already identified in your accounting system as a direct expense. And so once you've gone in, you've entered any personal services, um, any operational costs, and then, again, indirect costs are applicable towards meeting the match, then it will actually total the, the amount of that for the direct costs that information, again, will come over directly onto this certification tab and will pre-populate and break it out by each one of the cost objectives or the categories, so your personal services as well as operational and indirect costs, and then it'll give you that total amount of direct CSCT expenditures. Okay. Now, there's also a tab for what we're going to call CSCT non-direct. And again, these are those costs that we've talked about through our accounting guidance and kind of since the beginning we've had these discussions that that many costs you may have that are not directly billed, you know, again, that you're not using a project reporter code. An example may be like a, if you have a classroom, again, that's available, uh, then you can, you know, use a percentage of that classroom from the rental costs um, and apply that towards meeting the match requirement. Um, all of those would be, you know, down here under operational. Again, it could be a portion of utilities. It could be your custodial staff. And anything else that you can think of that, you know, think is reasonable that you should charge a portion of those or could be charging a portion of those costs to the CSCT program. Um, the way that it's designed is that it will, it has an annualized cost. And so again, if you have something like rent where you've got $100,000 for the year, you know, you could enter in that you've got $100,000 rental cost each year um, annualized. You know, you say that 5% of that rental cost goes towards the CSCT expenditures. And so let's say 5% of your overall um, you know, building space, you know, goes towards CSCT, whether that's a couple of classrooms or one, then you can enter that in there. It'll pre-calculate what that 5% is of that total annualized cost, and then it'll break it out into a monthly cost. And the reason why it's, it's broken out into a monthly cost is because each month when you actually submit your, for those claims that have been submitted, you have to attest that you have enough direct and non-direct CSCT expenditures to meet that month that month's worth of, of submitted claims and that match requirement. Um, so again, that's why it's done monthly. Again, same thing with uh, personal services. If you have, uh, again, a staff member, so you can say the superintendent, if you can say it's reasonable that, again, 5% of the superintendent's salary goes towards, you know, supporting the CSCT program, then same thing, you can enter in that position, enter in their annualized cost uh, salaries and benefits, and then the percentage that you think applies to their, again, involvement or uh, 
support of the CSC program, CSCT program. Um, it'll come up with what your total non-direct expenditures are. And then again, it does do a, an allocation based on a per month expenditure. And again, indirects will also apply to that as well. So once you've again got that total amount, that $1,240, that will again transfer over to the CSCT certification form, again, by personal services, operational, or indirects. And you can see that total amount. The report will then, or the, sorry, the, the form will then actually pre-calculate the total amount or the sum of both your direct and your non-direct CCT expenses. There is a, a row here for previous match carryover. And so let's say that, you know, in the prior month you had, um, you know, done your match, you had a $50,000 requirement, but say you actually had $60,000 that you identified total of direct and non-direct expenses that $10,000 that's remaining actually could be used as what we'll call carryover or applied to the next month's actual match certification. And so that, that amount can carry over. Um, one note about this previous match carryover, you know, you think about the program and when it's actually been um, started is that anything you have from July 1st until you actually have to do this first um, certification in January, any of those direct costs that you can identify or any of those non-direct costs that you can identify, those though technically are kind of building up, they are building up, and that those can actually be used to meet the future match requirements. And so everybody coming into this should have a little bit of a reserve up front. And so you should see, or when you complete this, um, you know, if you do it for, you know, the prior months and determine, you know, for the first quarter what you had, then you can actually use that um, as like a basis for, having that first initial carryover amount, which again will reduce the amount in the current month of what you're gonna need, okay? Um, again, so this $50,000 was entered up here. So the, the net amount of what was actually reported as the direct expenditures as well as non-direct um, included with anything that was carryover, it'll give you basically an over under, whether or not you're over or under what you met for the requirements. So in this case, it's a positive number. So there's $23,400 over of direct and non-direct costs that were identified um, of what that $50,000 requirement is. And so in the subsequent month, when you did the claim again, this 23,400 would be that carryover amount that you could use um, in, the, in, the, in the subsequent month's claim submission. Okay. Um, then in the bottom of it, we're just gonna ask that everybody, that the chief financial officer, the financial officer for you guys as provider is the one that signs off on this and basically certifies that it meets the requirements of the of the program um, is coming from a non-federal source and that, um, again, you guys agree that what you guys are attesting to is, is true and accurate. Um, when this, again, when the submission of this, when the pro program itself is actually going the, the IGT, um, what we're gonna have OPI do is we'll give you guys, I'm gonna have a, like a process guidance document that we're working on creating right now that what we'll have included with this CSD expenditure certification form will be um, an invoice from your third party provider for the claims that were submitted so we can certify the, the amount that we see out in the, that we're getting reported from DPHHS um, ties to what is actually being submitted. We'll also ask for an accounting printout from your system that shows that for like in this case, this $50,000 that you guys did book that from a non-federal source, that expenditure, so we can verify that. Um, and then also, um, again, the, the warrant will come with this that we'll use to deposit here at OPI. And then eventually, once we've done our certification process, um, we'll actually transfer those funds under DPHHS for um, reimbursement to the to the provider, um, which again will include the CMS portion of it, that 65%. And then again, as long as all of your match requirements are met, that 35% of match that you sent in. And so that's a, a quick overview of that. You know, when we as we get closer to this, again, I, I have an instructions tab on here that I still need to complete on here, which will also outline what documents we need you guys to submit with this. Oh, and let me. Uh, one one quick note too is that um, in the guidance you're also going to see that the first submission for um, claims to OPI, one of the documents that we're going to require is that you submit a copy of your negotiated um, rate with your third party provider, so that we can confirm that what you're actually um, being charged is is ties to what the actual allowable per diem rate is that was approved by CMS. And the reason why we need to do that is it's just an upfront thing is so that we can verify that your negotiated rate is at that 65% or higher. Um, we just got to make sure that if in the event that you guys have negotiated a rate that's lower, let's say you came in at 63%, we have to be sure that 
that 2%, we're actually billing DPHHS for actual costs and not for um, an amount that's over what um, your actual costs are. Otherwise, again, we get back into that situation where you have what's called that program income, which is um, an unallowable um, activity um, based on the, the program itself. Okay. So I'll stop there um, for a minute, um, see if anybody has any questions on that. Yeah, we've got a question from Denise. Okay. Denise, you can go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you hear me? I can. Yep. Yeah, lots of questions. <laughs> um, the first, I think the first one that comes to mind is so the spreadsheet. Um, first time I've seen it. I don't know about everyone else on the call, but um, is that posted on the OPI website somewhere where we could kind of review it a little and and kind of absorb it? Um, and and secondly, I think when you were first going through it, it almost seems like the spreadsheet is going to show all school districts on it, and so a district will have to find their line to find out what they need to write the check for. Is that correct? Yeah, thanks, Denise, for the question. So let me address the um, first one. Yeah, so absolutely. And this, the, for posting this, uh, we can make this available, and I'll make sure that Tristan has the, the location in so she can send this out. Um, this is kind of a draft document, and this goes back to one of those things where I've you know, requested from you, know, you guys as providers that look at this, this document. If it doesn't seem like it makes sense, or if you guys think that it's, you know, it's um, how it applies at the local level, again, doesn't really um, tie to what you guys' expectation is, or if you guys have an easier way of doing this, like I'm completely 100% open for suggestions. And so um, I'll make sure it gets posted out there this week. Uh, we'll give everybody a notification and um, please give me feedback on it. You know, the, the one thing I will say is that it's, you know, we, we got to try to do a couple things. One is we want to really... Um, keep consistent with the information that we're getting back from the providers so that it's, it's one it's in one format. And so when I came up with this, it was again, trying to make it so it was something that was easy for everybody. But again, the OPI, when we're doing our verification, we're going to be looking at the same documents. And so that we're not trying to have to figure out what's being submitted in the format. The, the actual calculations of direct and non-direct, these are, these are actually working documents. This is nothing that you're going to have to submit to OPI for, um, documentation, really what we're asking you to do is put in the amounts here that you have, um, certify that you're testing that these amounts themselves are um, reasonable and accurate and true. And then, you know, in the event under audit, it's going to be a, your guys' um, um, responsibility to make sure that you have this, the backup available. Okay. So Denise, that's question one. So the second one was um, hey, in regards. Jake, can I, can I, I uh, also say, so I'm sharing my screen right now. This is the CSCT page on uh, the OPI website. I've also posted the uh, link to this in the chat. Um, I can't. I don't think I actually put it in the attendees chat, but I'll put it in there as well. Um, and this match expenditure detail form is the form that D the J is just great reviewing. Yeah, great, great. Thanks, Tristan. And so, and one one quick mention. So when Tristan says there's that match expenditure detail form. The one thing I will request that when we're in the process, once we get going fully with the IGT process, is that you actually go there and pull that document each month um, from our website. And the reason for that is, is that, you know, as the process goes, you know, there's always going to be things we identified that may need changed or enhanced, kind of just based on experience as we go. And so as documents are updated to accommodate for any changes that we've made, we want to make sure that you guys, as the, the user of the form, actually have the most current version. And so please, um, each month or, you know, you go out there and look at it um, and make sure to pull it from there to start as your, as your front basis. Okay. And then, Denise, your second question. And so um, you're absolutely right that it will, it could potentially have multiple, but it won't. And the, the reason why that is, is that when we get this report from DPHHS, it actually has every single provider that submitted a claim in it. And what we're going to do is my staff will actually take that they'll create a um, unique report just like this for a school. So all they'll see is their one MPI number, their school, and then any of the members underneath there or team members underneath that MPI number will be listed on the second tab. But 
everybody will only get what applies to their districts or their schools uh, activity. Okay, so, okay, just slow down. <laughs> okay, so providing treater NPI, that is the school district, that's the school district as the provider, not the other providers, the actual providers of the services. Is that correct? Correct, that's right. So, so technically the provider um, for under Medicaid's um, terms is actually the the school itself and not the third party provider like all you like say like Alta care they're they they don't have their own MPI number it's the school that has that yep that provider yep. and then when you expanded that and showed schools are those like by school code those are schools within a district provider name yeah so those are schools that have the that use that same NPI number so that um, is what we'll call it I think DPHHS calls them a team Denise and so each one of those teams, you know, even though they're at an individual school, they're still all, all their claims are submitted underneath that one primary NPI number. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so again, yeah, we thought about that. We want to make sure that other people, other providers can't see other people's activity. So we'll make this individualized for everybody. Okay. Ultimately, how much does it, dis how does the district know how much to write their warrant for? So again, on the, sorry, let me bring this back up. So on the report itself, there's this column J and it's called the all CSCT state share. So for this $218,000 worth of claims submitted, their share that they have to write a check for is this 60,820. So column J. Column J, yep, yep. Yeah, and again, it'll, it'll be this all CSCT, all CSCT state share. And then again, like in the instructions, I'll make sure that we're clear that when you're looking at what your actual, the provider state share um, requirement is, is that it's it's called this itself, right? Okay. Um, and then there will be more instructions on, they're writing a physical warrant and sending it to OPI. Yep. Right. That's correct, yep. Okay. Um, all right. I, I, <laughs> I have so many questions. I, I think maybe I'll just stop there and let other people ask questions. Thank you, Jay. Yeah. No. And Denise, you know, again, you're you're a um, you know very uh, key partner with the schools, and so I mean, if you have questions, you know, outside of this, give me a call. I mean, let's, we can talk through it because again, you guys always have a different perspective than you know we do at OPI. Uh, maybe even in you know. To, versus the schools and so your guys' input is is extremely valuable so please please continue to do that okay i'll do that thanks jay thanks uh chris asks is the match 35 percent or 28 percent could you please give me more examples of personal services yeah so thanks chris so the 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 35 percent again as we we talked about that's that whole negotiated rate with uh the dphhs dphhs does with cms and so we've used that 35% because I think that's what um, we're, we're looking like that's going to happen. And so that like that $96 for DM rate, then you take 35% of that um, for each one of those daily um, uh, services that were rendered. And that's going to be your match requirement. The the 28%, I think if if that's your referencing, it's that's the percentage with the, the enhanced FMAP rate applied. And so again, that's that piece that um, right now the, the, uh, CMS is actually given out an additional a higher FMAP rate, which means that for any of the services that are being rendered right now, the actual state share requirement is dropped down to like that 20% versus the 35. Okay, um, we can't really tell you when. When I, when I talked to Megan, I asked if they have like an end date. We can't say when that's actually going to end. But again, what you want to make sure is that you're you're kind of budgeting at that 35%. Because eventually that FMAP percentage is going to, that higher FMAP percentage is going to go away. But what it does mean is that while it's actually being utilized is that as services are being rendered and your match requirements come through, um, if that 71% if that or that higher FMAP rate is applied, that, that absolutely, that means that when you get that report that we send out from DPHHS, that it won't actually be at the 35%, that it would be at that reduced rate because of that higher FMAP rate or say 28%. But, but again, for budgetary purposes, you want to make sure that you're projecting out for the year at that 35% just to be safe. And then the, in the event that that FMAP rate extends out further, you know, into January and even beyond, then you guys have that a little bit more flexibility as to how you guys want to use that funding. So, 
And then um, examples of personal services. And so are you talking about um, direct or kind of like a non-direct scenario? Direct, okay. So again, so I mean, any, anything direct. So, um, and speaking with some schools, they actually use, again, the you know, as the, the business clerks or, or business managers, you know, they use uh, those project, what's called a project reporter code. And they already have staff that are, you know, supporting the CSCT program itself that, you know, for part of their salaries or anything operational that they have, that they're using those project reporter codes. And so for those staff uh, members that they have, that they they can go ahead and they can log that or book that as actual direct expenses already. They, um, examples, you know, I mean, again, would be like teachers, you know, I think some school counselors, you know, may be involved in that. You know, I'm not sure quite 100 percent like all of the actual scenarios that personal staff, personal service would be used. But again, like teachers and certain staff supporting staff that would support those kids um, during the program itself it would all be applicable. Right? And then question, what if the school cannot show a 35 percent match one month? Um, that's kind of the, that's going to be a, an issue. You know, the if if a school can't meet the match requirement then we'll have to work with dphhs and we will only be able to dphhs will only be able to reimburse um at the percentage of what you can meet that match you know so i mean if you guys are if anybody is going to be in this position you know before they even submit the forms to opi when you guys are doing your calculations then that would be a, a an instance where you'd want to reach out to us and we'd want to talk about options and what we could do um you know, I still work with DPHS a little bit on the process. I'm not quite 100% sure at this point what we'll do in the event that somebody can't meet it. Um, I do know that if we receive a check that's for less than what the match requirement is, that we're actually going to suspend it at OPI um, and then reach out to the school. And then we'll have the discussion as to, well, you know, that the amount that you sent in doesn't meet the match requirement. Um, and then work with you guys one-on-one -on -one as to what can we do to be responsive to make sure you can get up that 35%. Jay, uh, Chris asks, if we have not set up a PRC, how do we show direct and indirect expenses since July? Right. So if you don't have a project reporter code that you're using currently, and you, but you already, if you have direct expenses that you can identify, I mean, as an accounting system, you can always go in there and do, you know, cost adjustments to your, to how those um, people are actually being paid. And so you have that option, you know, you can also show it that if you're not showing them as direct, but you can still have you have reasonable documentation that you can show that we can put them under the non-direct piece of it, then you can do that. Um, again, that that example I showed you with the CSD non-direct is kind of more of an example of, of a way that you can actually go in there and calculate that out. Um, but if you have another reasonable basis of how you want to do that, you know, reach out to me and we can have that discussion. Um, if it's something we need to make as an addition. But um, again, if you, get, if you have direct costs, you know, make some adjustments now. It's all within the same fiscal year, so you can do that. Um, and again, if you have those indirect pieces, then um, you can go back from July. Again, kind of thinking about it as, you know, if I was going to do it budgetarily here at OPI, you know, the reason why I did it as an annualized cost is because I'll do that, like with a lot of my um, um, other programs where we don't put them in like a direct piece, like say a rental allocation, um, we annualize that cost and then each month we break it out and we do a certain percentage based on, you know, you can do it on FTE, you can do it on the actual space. You know, spatialization by each one of the programs. Um, you can do it. Some people have done it, I know, based on for each one of the programs, based it on the amount of um, revenue stream that actually is applied to that program. You know, so if you have a, a Title I that has, you know, it's 50% of your revenue base, then it's not unreasonable that they would incur 50% of the cost associated with like rental, rental, the rental costs um, for that obligation. So, I mean, there's a couple different methods of how you can do that. Again, I've always started with annualized, and that's why I've presented it this way. But, again, if you have other um, recommendations, um, please shoot those forward my way. We can have that discussion. Does that answer your question, Chris? Good. Any other questions from the group?
Christopher asks uh, for annualizing some of the non-direct fixed costs. Would you suggest using a rolling 12 month look back or running the current month expense over 12 future months? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, you know, I think you could probably, I mean, you could do either or both. I mean, again, it's, there's, there's nothing that we're saying in this process that absolutely of how you have to, the methodology of how you come up with these costs. You know, the, with that said, you know, you always got to think about it from a reasonable standpoint is that, you know, in my calculations or in my assessments of what those costs would be, you know, is it, is it better to go back and do like a, you know, like you said, you could even do a five-year analytic if you wanted to, that shows the historic, you know, fluctuations, you know, if you're going to look at something back, I would actually go back pre-COVID, you know, definitely um, just because this last couple of years, things have been pretty crazy of, of actual costs. And so, you know, going back and doing a pre-COVID look and then using that as a projection basis to go out into the future, I think you can do that as well. You know, we, you know, here at OPI, we actually get a fixed cost where, you know, the legislative, during legislature, they tell us what our certain costs are. So we have a rental allocation that we know is going to be um, for the next biennium. And so I'm assuming that you guys, when you do your budget, you guys have to do something similar where you've got your your um, facilities costs already kind of fixed for the for the year, and then you again annualize it and you can break it out, you know, into the future. So, and you may notice that there's certain things that you know again may not always be a fixed cost, but costs that come up that are you know throughout the year that again that you can allocate out um, proportionately to the different programs. You know, that's those could be you know things you can use where you've got shortfalls in some months where you hold that back. And you actually use it in the, in the subsequent months where you your costs, your indirect costs aren't going to be as, as substantial or you may think, think that there's not going to be sufficient amount to meet your guys' match requirement. Again, we're trying to use as much flexibility as we can, um, understanding, one, it's a new process, too. And, again, there's nothing you can come in and say definitively this is exactly how you have to do it. So um, with that, I'd use your best judgment. Oh, Denise, you have your hand up again. You can go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm in a room with a few people and we're just having a, a discussion and a question came up about the MAC, the MAC program, the, the administrative claiming program, I think is what it is that they also do through DPHHS. This is different from that. Is that right? I'm sorry, Denise. Thanks for the question. I didn't, what, what program? So there's a, a program through DPHHS called the um, the MAC program. MAC? The Medicaid Administrative Claiming Program. And so the question is, these are two separate things, right? CSCT is separate from the other. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I have DPHHS answer that, but the MAC program, there's, there's no other program that is... Um, that should impact this directly. This is a this is a standalone program. Okay. Yeah. All right. so with that said, though, I will the one of the things I want to DPHHS to do when we have a chance is there is actually some additional ARPA funding. I think that they've said is going to be available, um, and CSCT will be part of that. And so, in our next meeting, I'll try to get Megan here so that she can um, talk about that. But it sounds like that for any of the Medicaid services that have been reimbursed for, you know the uh, Medicaid is going to allow, or CMS is going to allow, based on um, the amount of Medicaid revenues booked at each one at your school, that you can get an like a, a supplemental, or like I think it was fifteen percent was that first one, or fifteen percent of your Medicaid revenues you'll get as a supplemental to use towards other activities. Um, so I'll bring, I'll bring that up, but I'm not going to be able. To, I can't speak of it. But there's Renee here. Yeah, uh, Megan had asked me to join to talk. Perfect. So did you want me to? Yeah, if you don't mind, Renee, if you don't, if you could do that, that'd be great. Yeah, I don't mind at all. Okay, yeah. So um, as David was saying, I am. Um, um, well, I'll first introduce myself. I'm Renee Huffman. I am with Children's Mental Health Bureau and DPHHS. And yeah, so as Jay was saying, there's some additional funds through ARPA, and um, we're calling them supplemental payments. What happened is earlier this month, uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid approved a home and community-based service spending plan. And this spending plan allows a supplemental payment above and beyond the standard Medicaid payments. 
um, and it's designed for providers who deliver physical and behavioral health services in the home and in the community. And it's been approved for up to two years, starting immediately and then continuing through March 31st of 2023. And as Jay mentioned, it does include CSCT um, and it will be broken out by phases. So phase one is, um, is going to cover claims with dates of service April 1st of 2021 through September 30th of 2021 that have been paid by 1031 of 21. So lots of dates there, but um, for that period, providers will receive the funding in the next couple of weeks and it is 15% um, for phase one. The exact date of the payment is still um, to be determined, CMS is still doing um, some final reviews, but is expected to be, like I said, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and nothing is required from the providers for phase one. Uh, and then um, the other thing that's important to note is that the intent of this funding is to support service delivery and work um, for its retention and recruitment efforts. And then, um, Phase two is going to look a little bit different because um, it will be an opt-in program. So there will be some more details coming um, in the near future around uh, phase two. So uh, yeah, with that, does anybody have any questions? Does look like it. So thanks, Renee. Appreciate that. And like, like I said, um, we could probably give more updates as this kind of gets coming forward. But um, I just want to let you guys know that that's actually on the horizon here. And so there's a couple more questions I've seen here. One from looks like Mike. Um, when can we expect complete start to finish written guidance on all of this? I'm not comfortable signing contracts with our providers and negotiating anything until I can read through all the rules and completely understand them. Mike, thanks for the question. And so we're hoping to have... <clears throat> um, the instructions or just the instruction piece of this um, completed um, hopefully by the end of the week, if not beginning of next week. And so we'll have the form out there um, at Tristan and showed you guys out on their website um, in that um, instructions. It'll actually give the guidance again, where we talk about, you know, for that the negotiated rate contract um, the in need for invoices, the warrant and then the accounting stuff. And we'll have that available out there. The, the a guide, accounting guidance that we actually have posted on our website is still current. Um, even though we've been working with DPHHS to go through the actual IGT um, MOU that we're going to have everybody sign, um, that hasn't changed anything yet. The, the process, as we've been discussing, is still going to remain consistent. So, And then uh, Drea, I think, has a question. Just clarify if we have more than one team. We only fill out one spreadsheet for our direct slash indirect costs. And so that's... Um, Again, looking at that report that I sent out, that certification form absolutely does actually combine everybody within the team into one certification. The the mechanism at the you know you guys is at the local level of how you guys actually want to have those forms filled out. If you want to have each one of those members within the team fill out that form, send it to the the primary um, who actually going to sign off and send it send it in with the check. Um, that's kind of completely up to you guys. Um, we just wanted to make sure that you guys actually had. Um, for each one of those MPI, you know, groups that for each one of the teams, you have the individual data. And so you can see actually what claims were submitted by each one of the schools within that team and then what the match requirement was uh, for each for that team as, in its entirety. So. Thanks, Jay. And then Dustin, it looks like you have a question. You can go ahead. Hey, thank you. Can you hear me? You can. Yep, Dustin. Okay. Good morning. Good. Yeah, I was been trying to follow this. I think since what July, um, and looked at all the guidance that was on the website. A um, couple things were new today, I believe. Though the negotiated rate with our provider, um, that agreement needs to be sent to you. Um, what's the due date on that? Yeah, thanks, Dustin. So um, we'll actually have it, and it will again kind of going back to Mike's question about the guidance. Um, in there with your first claim submission where you're having to submit that first check for your match requirement is when we'll have you submit that negotiated rate um, that contract copy of that contract okay and you also mentioned an igt mou is that the same thing or 
No, so the one of the things that we've been putting together, we've been partnering with DPHHS, is that we're going to have an actual MOU signed with, it'll include, again, DPHHS, OPI, and then each one of the providers. Um, really, in all it is, it's a document that outlines what everybody's responsibility is. It does give a little bit of the procedure about the timing of what DPHHS needs to do, as well as OPI, and the actual processing, you know, it's from the collection to the processing, and then also the um, releasing of the payments out to the providers for the claims that were submitted. And so it's just to make sure that everybody um, understands their role in the process, they understand the process in its entirety, um, and that we all agree with it. It's, that it's, um, uh, we agree with the process, that, that how, it's, how it's designed. So so that'll come out, and that's something I guess we'll have to, um, and Dustin, thanks for bringing that up, because I think logistics, that's something we'll have to work with that we make sure that we actually have those out and um, kind of talking out loud here, I would suspect that we could have that submitted um, at the time when that first claim submission with the match is submitted in as well, if that seems reasonable. And that first match is when the bridge funding um, is exhausted. It, and I'm sorry, I didn't catch when. when is the current expectation of that? Yeah, great. Thanks, Dustin. Good question. So, yeah, so the, the expectation is, again, is that we've um, DPHS has kind of calculated, they believe that they're going to have enough of the bridge funding to cover all of November's claims. Okay. So in December, as those services, the CSCT services are provided, those are the services that you'll submit to be um, reimbursed in January. So the December claims that are submitted and reimbursed um, in January will be the first time that the schools will have to submit in that match, the state share match. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Could it <laughs> Can I just quickly go through sort of if, say, our provider um, billed $100 in December, right, so that in January, would we obtain an email with that report you were showing us with their match requirement, or do we have to go find that on the OPI website, or how does that work? Good question, Dustin. So I, what we're planning on doing is actually emailing that out, and so we'll have the, you know, the, the primary contact of everybody, and I'm Assuming like we can work on that, you know, if we typically would send something like that to the business manager, the clerk, would that be reasonable? Or is there somebody else you think of that would be more suited to receive that? No, I think that'd be fine. Or even like, uh, I think we've done in the past sort of with like, you know, e-grants where it has like, we can say who, who we want it to go to. I don't know if that'd be another, um, you know, form of correspondence back and forth, but maybe something to that effect too might be helpful. I know some of the bigger school districts, they probably have someone dedicated just to this piece maybe. Perfect. Okay, yeah, and I think what we'll do is like, we've been working with DPHHS to get the contact information. I know here at OPI we retain who the business clerk and business manager is, but um, maybe kind of, again, talking out loud, we should we could make a document available on our website, like a Google form that um, folks can go out there and actually submit who they would like that email to go to. But but again, I think part of the, just because of the sensitivity of some of the information, we want to make sure that it's not um, available on our webpage, but it goes directly to each one of the providers. Awesome. And I, again, I don't want to steal everyone's time, but could I ask one final, final question? Sure. Yeah. So um, say the $100, again, back to the $100 uh, is billed by our provider. Um, you're going to show us a form that says, we have to pay $35. Um, say I don't have any other non-federal source besides the general fund. So I pay that $35 out of the general fund. Um, we get the $100 back and we put it into the CSCT project reporter code. Um, so now I have $100 there. Say I pay my provider 65, right? That's kind of the agreed upon. Um, so then I still have $35 left in the CSCT uh, program code. And then I paid 35 out of the general fund. And so in order to make this not a burden to the district, I would have to reclassify indirect costs that were paid out of the general fund back into that CSCT program code. Sorry, I just, is that sort of the realm of how we're supposed to do this? Right. Yeah, you're, yeah, good, good question, Dustin. So I, again, I know the logistics of some of the kind of this gets kind of gets, uh, confusing. And so you're right. So when you guys actually receive back that $100, 
you know, it's going to go into that fund 15 miscellaneous funds. Um, and again, under that, that CSCT um, revenue uh, coding. And so you're right, you pay the provider that $65, you paid out of your fund 15. And then that remaining $35 is to be used for kind of at your guys' discretion. You know, my understanding is it, as it comes in, it doesn't have any federal ties to it anymore. Medicaid says that it's, you know, it's kind of a, it's, we'll call it non-federal very cautiously um, because you can't use it, you know, actually to recycle to meet future match requirements. But again, you can use it operationally for other expenditures within your guys' school. Okay. The one thing you can't do is you can't go in there and take, let's say you got that $35, you have an expense in your general fund that you've booked as a CSCT uh, expenditure. You can't go in and abate that, that general fund expenditure that was used to, to document that match being sent in and move those costs over to that miscellaneous fund because that does, in essence, that basically washes out that you even did a match at all. Okay, And so I know that's in the IGT process, kind of talking through this with with clerks and with the superintendents, it you know, and their to use their their wording is it sounds a little bit kind of like a shell game. Um, it's kind of a budget thing, is where you know you've got to have this cost up front out of these non federal sources, and so again, in your instance, you use general fund, um, so you have to be able to show that that expense happened in the event that CMS or even OPI come down and look at that activity. But when you receive that thirty five percent, we'll call it on the back end that can be used to offset, you know, if you want to say future CSCT costs or other, other, again, operational costs. So it still goes into your budget and can be used. It's just that it has a different classification, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you for the insight. And I guess, um, and I <laughs> keep asking, but like, so when you said that it might be 28%, that first uh, because of the additional federal funds or whatever, so in theory, if we had a negotiated rate with our provider at 65, um, we would be retaining 7% more. Um, that sit, sits there and is that kind of considered like that non-revenue you were saying we couldn't have in, in that program? Well, what will happen um, is that when you're, when you're submitting your match requirement, you're not gonna have to submit as much. And so, again, we go back to that um, example where if you had a $100 claim, you know, instead of you, you know, sending to your, you know, receiving back $65, you're going to receive back 71 But out of that, it means also means that your match liability requirement gets reduced by that additional percentage. And so you're still going to pay out the same amount to provider, but you have to, you, you submit actually less for your match requirement, if that makes sense. So it's not like you're having program income in that instance. It's just the amount that actually they're reversing that the CMS is reimbursing, which then again directly impacts what you need to send in for your match. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then, yeah, just with regards to reclassifying, I mean, I said you, you said you can't abate the expenditure, which I understand, but let's say we had custodial supplies or custodian, we would just, that was originally paid out general fund, we would just say, okay, now that piece, whatever percent we put on that certification form, is now an indirect cost of CSCT, and we've got that $35 sitting in that program. So we're just gonna move that out of the general fund into there because we already paid the match out of the general fund. So in theory, the general fund should be zero net, you know, out. Yeah. But yeah. does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, again, that's what you can, again, that's kind of that, using that, that additional money to offset any of those other costs. Um, yeah, that's what it can be used for reasonably. Yeah. The one thing you got to be careful of, though, is when you start thinking about the direct costs that you have, that you don't reduce them to the extent that you can't meet that meet that monthly match requirement. If that makes sense, so you still got to make sure you have enough direct costs to to tie to that that match requirement. All right, final question. That's it. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks, Dustin. Good questions. Appreciate those. Yeah. Jay, we've got one related question uh, from Jane. She's asking, you can recode the $35 out of miscellaneous fund back into the general fund, but just not into the same expenditure that you paid the original $35 out of? That's right. Yep. Yep. And again, because so that, that's a miscellaneous fund. And so what the, the use of those, um, you have flexibility of how you can do that. Again, you just can't go in there, one, recycle it to use it as future match or to reduce the actual or wipe out that match piece of expenditure that you had incurred to submit um, in with your, your claim payment. Thanks, Jay. 
All right, Denise, you've got another question. Um, more of a clarification. So the check that's coming out of the general fund or whatever other fund that they're using to make the match payment, they're using a transfer resources code, right? We, we set up a special expenditure code for a resource transfer to another fund. That hasn't changed, has it? It hasn't, no. No, Denise, it hasn't. Yeah, so when you and I had kind of had this initial discussion, we came up with some of those account entries, it's the same thing. They're still booking and using that project reporter code to show that they're sending those funds out. So for in the example of the general fund, they're writing the warrant, they're coding, they're using a transfer code. Um, because it's a, a transfer of resources, it's not to another fund, it's actually to another entity. And then when they get the money back, from DPHHS, they're putting it in fund 15. And at that point, they're taking expenditures from the general fund that are related to CSCT and they're simply recoding expenditures. I think that's what Jane's question is getting to, but I think there needs to be clarification on the coding of the initial check written to OPI. It's a resource transfer. So if you could maybe include that in the instructions I think they understand that a little better um, in terms of uh, you know what they can take at, recode out of the general fund and use their in, um, with their money that's now sitting in fund 15, and it, it does end up being a wash. Yeah, to some extent, you know. Again, I, I'm not sure about the Denise. I got to check about. I'm not sure. Or talk to you about the actual terminology of a resource transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, because you, you guys may use that terminology different than I do like here at the state level. Because when I transfer funds to another agency, it does show up as an actual expenditure. Um, but it's because I'm giving it. The budget authority. What's that? It counts against their budget authority in the general fund. I mean, I'm not disputing that, but it's not an expenditure like other expenditures that they're uh, using to support their, their CSCT program are. It's, it's a transfer of resources to another entity. Right. Yeah, so let me let me uh, let me talk to my school finance division a little bit about that and then I'll we can call you back and talk about that outside of this. Um, again just again my apologies because some of that some of the, the more intricacies of some of that school level of accounting um, I may not have the the best knowledge base to give you guys a hundred percent direction on that one right now. So but I can get you an answer on that for sure. So okay. Any other questions, guys? I'm not seeing any new ones. Okay. Well, we're just about out of time anyway, guys. And uh, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to come and meet with us oh, today. Jay, oh. let me interrupt you really quick. Chris has one more question. Um, schools that cannot meet the new guidelines will need to end their CSCT programs? So... Um, Chris, I think that'd probably be something um, better directed, like on a one-on-one. -on -one. You know, the the intricacies of each one of the schools and what their circumstances are um, based on the CSC program. I don't know that there's a kind of one-size-fits-all an answer to that. And so, if you don't mind, if I can reach out to you after this, and we can talk a little bit more um, about that. Does that work? Okay. Okay. Okay, guys. Well, again, thank you for everybody for joining with us. Um, and then we'll look forward to, again. If once we get that, we have that posted out there. If you know anybody has any suggestions on the guidance that we've got um, or the the forms that we're creating to try to make the process as easy as possible, please reach out to me and let me know your guys' suggestions um, or just shoot me a call. Um, again, you guys as the ones that are going to be directly involved in this process. You know your guys' uh, perception of or perspective. Um, uh, ideas of how the process can work, you know, easier, or if the forms or guidance we've got, um, again, can be made easier, um, please convey that to us because, you know, our intention here is always is to make this as easy as possible on everybody um, and make sure that we go smooth and that the CSCT program itself does not uh, have any uh, bumps in the road as we get into the IGT process. So, 
So thank you guys, everybody. Enjoy the week. Looks like it's going to be nice. And uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you.